Shalom, brothers and sisters. My name is Adam here with Parable of the Vineyard, and I'd like to share a couple things that I think you may want to know regarding Passover coming up really soon. Everything we discuss today will be in article form, so if there's anything you'd like to go back and restudy for yourself at your own pace, I'll make sure to have this link for you in the description box below and the pinned comment. So, Passover, what to avoid. So, Shalom family, Pesach or Passover 2023 is almost upon us, and there's something that needs to be voiced. It seems that many of you have questions about the meal and the service, rightly so. The scriptures tell us to eat three things, lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. That's it. Yet the predominant rendition of the Passover meal is the Seder plate and service. Most are unaware that this practice stems from pagan origins, as we will prove momentarily. Is this something we should be intermingling with this holy day that represents our Messiah? Let's begin with the word. Exodus 12 explains the contents of the Passover meal. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, the lamb, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Exodus 12, 8. This is the meal. Why then are many people eating a Passover meal consisting of eggs, haroset, which is a mixture of fruit, nuts, and wine, and other foods not given to us in Scripture? This is typically what is widely known. This is called the Passover Seder plate. Furthermore, why are the masses not eating the lamb? Don't you think that's symbolic, considering Messiah is the lamb and this feast is all about him? We'll come back to that later. The truth is, Yahweh, that's how we understand our Heavenly Father. Some people say Yahweh or Yehovah, whatever. We understand it as Yahweh. So the truth is Yahweh hates when people celebrate him in man-made ways. Our Messiah often rebuked the religious leaders for their man-made teachings. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, These people draw close to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men that was matthew 15 7 through 9. so i ask you do any of you want to worship him in vain just a question the seder meal is a man-made tradition that you won't find anywhere in the word nowhere so though millions will be celebrating the passover meal in the weeks to come how many will be doing it his way after all this is all about him isn't it it's a question Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahuwah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So these aren't Jewish festivals. These are feasts of the Most High. They're his. They're not for the Jews. They're his. I'm not saying they're for the Jews. They, are, they, they come from the Most High himself. Leviticus 23, 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, that's the Hebrew word for, for God as we understand it, which I command you, Deuteronomy 4, 2. So because the Passover meal is so unrecognizable compared to how Exodus 12 through 13 describes it, is the feast his anymore? Is it still his? And this is what he says in Isaiah. He rebukes them. Your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Isaiah 1.14 Many people are waking up and recognizing the true blessing of celebrating the feast days our Heavenly Father instituted thousands of years ago. The problem is many are leaning too heavily on Judaism for answers. If you've read the gospel accounts, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you know how often our Messiah rebuked the vain traditions of the Jews we're so accustomed to. Moreover, modern-day Judaism is nothing other than Pharisaic practices with 2,000 years of room for more additions. Rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism also called Rabbinism or Rabbinicism or Judaism espoused by the Rabbinites, has been the mainstream form of Judaism since the 6th century CE after the codification of the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud, uh, I'll just give you the, the short on that, the Talmud is their authoritative uh, book. It, they actually elevate it higher than uh, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. Uh, it says here, uh, let's see. 
Rabbinic Judaism contrasts with the Sadducees, Karaite Judaism, and Samaritanism, which do not recognize the oral Torah as divine authority, nor the rabbinic procedures used to interpret Jewish scripture. Um, so I'm, myself, growing up as a Jew, I can attest that the Talmud is, ha is held in higher regard than the Torah writings and the prophets. They won't say that, but in actual practice, that's what happens. So what I'm talking about here is not anti this word right here. This is, has nothing to do against a group of people. What this has to do, this is about cleaning house. In fact, Messiah told us to beware of and cut out their doctrine. That is the doctrine of the Pharisees, which is again, what we saw here is what modern Judaism is all about. Then Yahusha, this is how we understand our, our uh, Messiah's name. Some say Yeshua, uh, Yahusha, um, there's different, different uh, pronunciations, but this is how we understand it. So, then Yahusha said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then a little bit later, then understood they, that's the disciples, how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's Matthew 16, 6 through 12. So Messiah told us to beware of their teachings, of their doctrines. So my question to you is, will we, will we be celebrating Passover with the leaven of the Pharisees this year? That's a question. Only you can answer. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. This is from Paul. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's a link here if you want to find out the biblical definition of what truth actually is. And that was 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. So perhaps it's time to follow the doctrine our Messiah taught, echoed by Paul. Let's remove the leaven, the doctrine, from this feast day, as well as other areas of our worship towards Yahweh the Most High. So now, let's go straight to the source. This is a Jewish rabbi, and hear exactly where the Seder came from. This is about a, a three-minute clip that I'd like to share with you. So here we go. Shavuot Tov from Shechter. As we approach the holiday of Pesach, I would like to talk about the Seder and the Symposium. Where did the Seder come from? If you look through the entire Tanakh, you will find no mention of the Seder. If you look through all the Second Temple sources, you will find no mention of the Seder. The Seder is first mentioned in the Mishnah and Tosefta Psachim, chapter 10, which was apparently written at the end of the Second Temple period. In 1957, Siegfried Stein published a famous article in the Journal of Jewish Studies, in which he shows that the Seder took the forms of the Greek symposium or banquet and transformed them into the Pesach Seder. For example, the Mishnah tells us that we must recline on a couch during the Seder, and if you look here at the picture of a Greek symposium, you will see that all the participants are reclining on couches. Similarly, we are told in the Talmud Bavli in the Tractate of Sachim that you have to recline on your left arm at the Seder. So too, if you look at the pictures of the Greek symposium, they were all reclining on their left arm. At the Seder, we dip chazeret, or lettuce, romaine lettuce, in salt water. That's exactly what they did at the symposium. At the Seder, we eat haroset. That was one of the standard foods served at the symposium. At the Seder, we have the Korech, we have the Hillel sandwich. Once again, this was a standard custom at the symposium. Similarly, the Mishnah talks about the Afikoman after the Paschal lamb, and Professor Saul Lieberman proved in the 1930s that the Afikoman is a slight variation on the Greek word epikomon, and epikomon was a custom of carousing after the uh, symposium, going from house to house, dancing, singing, drinking, and you're not allowed to do that after the Paschal sacrifice. In a similar fashion, the literary forms of the Seder are based on the symposium. For example, the four questions, which are really quite simple. At the symposium, the questions asked were also very simple. In the Haggadah, we read about the five sages reclining all night long in B'nai Brak. Similarly, at the symposium, they would recline all night long. Another parallel, the Mishnah in Sachim says that one must explain Pesach, Matzah, and Maror at the Seder, and the items must be lifted up when explaining them. So too at the symposium, they would lift up a piece of food and give an explanation about that piece of food. At the Seder we sing the Nishmat, one of the most beautiful prayers in our liturgy, in which we talk about 
they are mouths filled with song as the sea. At the symposium, they would sing songs in praise of the emperor. What can we learn from all of these parallels? The Jewish people throughout the generations did not live in a vacuum. They absorbed much from their surroundings, but they did not absorb blindly. The sages took the form of the symposium and entirely changed the contents of the symposium and turned the symposium into the Seder. The Greeks and the Romans discussed love, beauty, food, and drink. The sages discussed the exodus from Egypt, the miracles of God, and the greatness of the Geula or the redemption. The symposium was meant for the elite. The Seder was meant for the entire Jewish people. We are bombarded today by a host of outside influences from the Western world. May God give us the wisdom to selectively adopt some of their forms and to fill them with Jewish content as the sages did at the Seder. Chag Kasher V'Sameach. May you have a joyous Seder and Passover holiday. So needless to say, I obviously do not agree with everything he just mentioned, but I wanted to share this with you because the information was correct. So you can hear from your, for yourself straight from their, their own mouth that the Seder come, came directly from the, the Greek Symposium, which we'll, we'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, the the Greco-Roman Symposium, which is a dinner and drinking party where participants ate and drank by the numbers. For example, everyone lift up the egg, and recite something or a prayer or a chant and then eat. And that's exactly what the Passover Seder is. So my question to you is, do you think the Most High wants any of this? Do you think he wants a mishmash of the Passover meal and a Greek symposium? Of course not. He tells us not to do that. Matter of fact, I think it's in Deuteronomy 12. He says, don't worship me in the way that the pagans do. He wants nothing to do with it. So, in any case, the, the symposium was a feast of reveling or partying. We know what the scriptures say in Galatians 5 and in Revelation about those who are revelers. Why would we want to mix anything that had to do with origins of these Greek, the Greek symposium? So, there's so much more to cover regarding how to keep the Passover with sincerity and truth, as Paul encouraged. And I'd like to point out our most recent study on the topic. Uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, um, the Passover 2023. This is an in-depth look at the Passover meal and week of unleavened bread using the scriptures only. So if you have questions of like, hey, we want to do Passover, but we just don't know how, uh, I'd love to suggest that for you. So there will be a link there in the description box as well, as well as the link here in the article. So let's finish up here. The Talmud, the Lamb, and finishing up. So as we mentioned earlier, I find it highly symbolic that the Jewish tradition of Passover excludes eating of any actual lamb meat. You just stare at a lamb bone all night. And as a child growing up, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. But okay. I mean, they'd have an explanation for that, of course. But um you know, it doesn't make any sense. So some might say, and this is part of what their reasoning, some might say the lamb can be only eaten in Jerusalem or with a temple standing. However, that's not what Messiah teaches. In fact, he foretold a time would come where the place of worship or celebration would not matter. This is the time in John 4 when he's sitting with the woman at the well. Yahusha, or Messiah, said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. John 4, 21 and 23. So he's saying right here, there's going to be a time where, you know, the place of Jerusalem is not going to matter. Because he knew that shortly after his death, burial and resurrection, that uh, in 70 AD it would be destroyed. And the the race uh, of, of the Yahudim, the Jews, and all the others would be spread across the four corners of the earth. So we discussed this point much further in our full study um, that was just cited as far as why I believe that we can celebrate the Passover uh, anywhere we're at in the four corners of the earth right now. So the Talmud, right? So these teachings come from the Talmud. The Talmud right here is the central text of rabbinic Judaism and the primary source of Jewish religious law and Jewish theology, right? So this is, this is the book. And so again, my, my position here is not to attack these people, but the doctrine, right? 
So this has nothing to do with uh, attacking a group of people. Matter of fact, as I mentioned earlier, I came from this group of people. So I'm not hating on the, own, the, the same group of people I came from. Uh, praise be to Yah, he pulled me out of Judaism and showed me his son and the truth. And so I'm here to, to give you a position of understanding both Judaism and Christianity, but showing really the true way which avoids all man-made doctrine. So the truth is the Babylonian Talmud is the enemy of Messiah and our Heavenly Father. It is the central source of doctrine for Judaism. We'll finish up with a few quotes from this book of doctrine, the, the, uh, the Talmud. So in this book, the Jews say our Messiah is boiling in excrement. I'm not even going to read this, uh, but and I want to let you know that these passages are not taken out of context. They're not just cherry-picked. These are just chunks of, of, of um, well, we call it scripture from their book. This is not scripture, but this is uh, passages, excuse me, from their book, the Talmud. So it literally says our, their book literally says our Messiah is boiling in excrement in hell. Uh, so I, again, I ask you, don't you think it's symbolic that they don't eat of the lamb? And why would we follow their practices? Uh, Gentiles are animals, not people, and that's why they call them dogs. Again, I, I know this growing up. Uh, obviously, I don't believe that. But I remember that this is often cited. So I'm not going to read this because I don't even want to repeat it. But this will be here for those of you that want to do your own research and see what their book says for yourself. Um, Jews can, I don't even want to read this, uh, but you can see it for yourself. And they literally uh, say that this is, is uh, legal according to Talmud. Um, Jews can also do this according to their book. And this is still in their books today, in the Talmud. This is still written right now. Um, so again, I ask you, is this, is this really where we want to glean our wisdom from? Uh, right here, this is a link. This is a link to another practice that the Talmud promotes that I don't even want to show on screen uh, or even mention. I will say it, it has to do with circumcision and uh, a rabbi's mouth. And it's, it's still being done today and it's still taught in the Talmud. So I ask to those of you who want to serve our creator in spirit and truth and in the light of Messiah, should we be leaning on the Jews for doctrine anymore? specifically their Talmud and, and their oral traditions. It's time for a revolution for Yahweh's people, walking away from the traditions of men and back to his word. Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18 says. So again, if you like a more in-depth study on how to celebrate Passover by the scriptures only, see the study below. We cover the how, when, why, where, and prophecy regarding Passover. So here's uh, some links for further research on the Greek Symposium. This, this red part here is a link. How the Greek Symposium and the Seder Service relate. Uh, wicked passages in the Talmud and more. So I hope this was uh, good information for you. Blessings and shalom. And I pray that you have a blessed Passover uh, whenever, whatever calendar and wherever you do celebrate it. Shalom.